Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Philip Wegman, and on behalf of Young Americans Foundation, I'd like to welcome you to this commemoration of Lady Margaret Thatcher. When absolutism threatened freedom, Prime Minister Thatcher answered liberty's call of duty. Unwavering in her principles, the Iron Lady championed the cause of freedom during the darkest hours of the Cold War. As lesser men shrunk away, this woman stood by Reagan's side to stare down communism. With her passing, we have lost a courageous leader, but gained a rich legacy of freedom. Today, we are privileged to hear from our own president, Dr. Arne, a friend and close colleague of this great woman. President Arne and Penny both knew Lady Thatcher, and we are blessed to share in their memories. Many of us were born long after Thatcher stepped away from politics, and sadly, she has begun to recede into the distant memory of our generation. So today, I urge you to honor her legacy learn for her example, and listen well to the words of Dr. Arne. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming our president. Thank you, Mr. Wegman. I'm going to begin by pointing out that I was not Margaret Thatcher's friend. She was a great person, and friendship is for equals. I was her admirer, and I did happen to know her pretty well for a long time. Uh, I get a chance to thank uh, Bill and Pat Lamoth for their contribution to this statue right here. Uh, they're the best people in the world. And Joe Moss, who has, uh, I think they're going to get to see this tape, who gave us the chair that Mark Nussbaum over there holds. And uh, Joe is very proud of Mark. He was very mindful that uh, Lady Thatcher had studied chemistry. And if Joe had got his way, we would have named the whole college for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, she was born in 1925, in October. Uh, her father was a grocer. She was born in Lincolnshire and kind of in the middle of England. Uh, she studied chemistry in Oxford. She uh, got elected to Parliament pretty soon for Finchley, which she uh, represented until she died. Sorry, yeah, until she retired, I'm sorry, from, from the House of Commons. She was uh, in the House of Commons from 1959 until her retirement in 1990. Um, she's one of the great prime ministers in British history, one of the, the second longest serving, at least in continuous times. Uh, I happened to live there when she was elect, when she was, uh, when her party won the 1979 election and she became prime minister, the first woman prime minister. It was better than watching sports on television. There was nothing like it. Every day, something big would happen. And every day, she would not apologize for it. Usually, she made it happen. Uh, I was lucky enough to know Ronald Reagan pretty well, too. And uh, my wife and I moved back from England, a uh, married couple at that time, um, the month before Ronald Reagan was elected president. And he used to say to me, uh, you should move abroad from time to time and then come back. You seem to be lucky when you do that. And uh, there was something I told him that he always remembered. Uh, I said, you know, sir, you've always seemed a little soft to me. And uh, the second time, he, he brought that up to me, the second time I ever met him, because, of course, I'd been watching her. And you just never saw anyone so direct or clear of speech. And it, she faced a situation that was devastating. Um, it's like the situation we have today in the country. I'll say something about that in a minute. Um, and what she did was make plain that situation and place great faith in the people of her country. And then when they were asked to choose, they chose for her over and over again. Indeed, she never lost an election after she won the first one. She lost her job as prime minister because her party got tired of her, were not as strong as she was, and they threw her out. That was a big thing, and uh, she left very nobly. I'll tell you a minute about her connection with the college. She spoke for the college on the campus here in 1994. She made at least five other appearances for the college over the years. Um, she was very fond of Hillsdale College. She knew all about it. Um, when we would have a cruise that would end in London, we would often put together a lunch and a dinner, and she would come. And I was privileged to have lunch or dinner with her several times apart from that. Um, 
when I wrote her about the statue, I was uh, full of trepidation because she's an opinionated woman and I was afraid she'd say no. And if she did say no, then it might mean war and certain defeat if you went ahead anyway. <laughs> but no, she was very friendly to the idea. And then uh, Bruce Wolfe is the sculptor of this of the statue. He was chosen by a panel of faculty members. I think Tom Connor was on the faculty committee. Sam Connect was for sure. And uh, they recommended him to me and I went and made an arrangement with him. And I told him, I said, you know, we're going to have to get the approval of this woman because I can't imagine having a statue on the campus of Hillsdale College that she didn't like. And uh, Bruce Wolf was prepared to, he's a very distinguished sculptor, but he was prepared to put up with that. And so we took to sending her photographs of the thing as it was underway. And uh, I got a sort of a mild, nice the first time. And then my wife commented on something that I think was um, proved to be uh, insightful. Penny said, maybe the skirt's too short. So I called a lady that I it worked for Lady Thatcher that I knew well, uh, Ann Worthing was her name, and I called her up and I said, Ann, I've got a question for you. I said, uh, is the skirt too short? And Ann said, good point. <laughs> so they weren't telling us, but and then after that, Lady Thatcher was effusive. I, I'll show it to you if you want to see it. I got a lovely letter from her about the statue and how much she admires it. And it is the only statue of her in North America. And after that, I, I think I mentioned this in convocation, but it's worth telling again. I uh, saw her not long after we dedicated the statue, and I showed her photographs of it in its place. She liked them a lot. I said that she'd made a mistake about the skirt. She said, why? And I said, uh, you do have very nice legs. And she said, well, I've been told that. <laughs> I'll tell you two quick stories about her that I observed. Um, there was a coal strike. There was a man named Arthur Scargill, who was a very left wing. I think he was, called himself a communist, who was the head of the coal miners union. And the coal miners were tough because people got their heat from coal. And so if they didn't mine coal in the winter, then people got cold. And there was a major political party, the other major political party than hers, that was basically uh, controlled in its governing structure by the labor unions. And the worst or most aggressive of them was the coal miners. And Margaret Thatcher stored up a bunch of coal to get ready for a strike because she knew this guy was going to do it. And he called a strike, and he, in the coal mining regions of the country, they had thousands of people picketing many, many companies. And parts of the country basically stopped to function. It had happened many times. And there was in 1984, I think it was, the uh, Battle of Orgreave, it was called. There were 5,000 miners and there were 5,000 policemen who showed up to arrest them. And they arrested them all. And there was 130 casualties. And I think that was a battle for the soul of the country. And uh, Prime Minister Thatcher, she was then, you can remember her going on TV, happened to be there for much of that time in 1984. I'd gone back to do some work. And um, she was just very clear about it. She said that the stakes in this are enormous and we're going to stand up for the country. And she had that, uh, she, she, she's the only politician I've ever seen who made powerful rhetorical use of the word nothing. She loved the word nothing. And nothing was always applied in this sense. Nothing will make us go back on our responsibilities. And I noticed what the use of that word did in interviews, for example, because journalists love to get you to say, of course, I'm mindful of the other side. And then they begin to ask a series of leading questions about how you'll move that way. If nothing is your opening position, what's the follow-up question? You know, if the four horsemen of the apocalypse show up, nothing, she says. <laughs> and, and what happened was a large part of the membership of the mine workers seceded from the union and formed their own union. 
and uh, made a deal that was very lucrative for themselves, but not what had been demanded. And she basically broke that strike, and she broke that kind of unionism. The other kind, the kind where people under laws that are fair and, and uh, don't let people take over parts of the country or the property of others, that kind thrives in Britain today. But, you know, there has not been an effort to bring back that old kind, not since she did that. Another thing was terrorism. You, you probably know that uh, Lady Thatcher was almost killed. Uh, they put a bomb in a hotel. The, Labor, the annual Conservative Party conference is scheduled a year and a half. And there's a certain suite in a hotel where the head of the party always stays. And so some IRA terrorists checked into that hotel months in advance and buried in the wall an explosive device, carefully shielded it to go off at 1 o'clock in the morning or midnight in the bedroom where she slept. It did go off, blew up much of the hotel. And uh, she happened to be, uh, her husband was not with her. And she happened to be working late in the study next door. And her life was spared, although she was seriously injured by that. And that's one of two episodes because one of her very best friends in the world was a man named Ari Neve. And Ari Neve was a very distinguished soldier in World War II. He's one of the few men to escape German POW camp at Coldus and come back and rejoin his forces and fight out the rest of the war. A very great man by every account. Very close to Lady Thatcher, and he was the Secretary for Northern Ireland in her government. And they put a bomb in his car so that when the car was at a certain high angle, such as coming out of the parking lot underneath the House of Commons, the bomb would explode. And her friend Ari Neve was killed serving in her government by that bomb, having survived the Nazis. So Margaret Thatcher had strong reasons to oppose terrorism. And so when it happened that uh, about seven or eight of them, as I recall, but the, the key one was a man named Bobby Sands went on a hunger strike in the Mays prison in Northern Ireland to be reclassified from murderers to political prisoners. She let them starve to death. And the statements were remarkable, you know, because she was asked about it every night. You know, it went on for weeks. And uh, she always said the same thing. The thing that I said at convocation, she said when the, uh, when the um, leader, Bobby Sands, it was reported to her, she was in Saudi Arabia, to have died, she said, a crime is a crime is a crime. Uh, nothing can change that. And what that meant was everybody knew they had chosen the wrong, you know, unless they could string it out until the next election. <laughs> they had uh, chosen the wrong time to go on a hunger strike. And they didn't back down, and she didn't back down. I'll tell you what I think all that means. Um, I've thought about this most of my adult life, and much of what I think about it is informed by watching her. I think we live in an age when a new kind of government has been invented. And it's not so much that it has different aims, although it does have many different aims. It has some of the same aims. The point is it proceeds by a different method. Today is Earth Day. It turns out that Abraham Lincoln signed the first in environmental protection order in American history. He protected Yosemite. And if you've ever been there, you'll be thankful that he did that because there's no more beautiful spot on Earth. But now we protect the environment and we do everything else by a different kind of method. And that's, this method is distinguished by rules at the top. Rules made by experts who, in their great number, gather the force of government over themselves. There's an agency been created lately in the United States, and that agency does not get its budget from the Congress of the United States, but from a percentage of the revenues of the Federal Reserve, which gets its revenues as a government monopoly bank. That agency has some regulatory power that may affect us. And the Congress of the United States is forbidden to hold hearings into the budget of that agency. And it routinely now refuses inquiries from the Congress about its operations. That means it is sealed off from popular control. And the weight and scale of the government run by this new method 
whatever are the, met, are the goals that it pursues, means that there's some chance that the government is going to overwhelm the society. And that is uh, the very abnegation of liberal politics. Liberal in the sense of free, a free people managing those who govern them because each person born on earth has a natural right to consent to the government over him. Well, the greatest servant of that principle of liberal government that I have ever seen with my own eyes is this lady here. And I, I pray that we will see the like of her again because the battle over this kind of government, not always the purposes of government because many of the things that modern government does, including protecting the environment, are very important. They need to be done. But there is a way to do it under constitutions and under the control of free people. For making that clear, for fighting for that more effectively than I have ever seen in my own life, we today remember this great woman, Baroness Thatcher of Kesteven. Thank you for coming. <laughs>